Hey everyone, welcome back to the Gas Powered Bike Channel. And as always, if you're new and just happen to catch this video, welcome to the Gas Powered Bike Channel. Okay, what we are going to do today is bring this little guy back to life. Now it originally started out, and they are good little motors in case anyone has uh, been looking into them and you're wondering, I wonder if those are any good or not. This one was one of the all-in-one head and cylinder engines. And it was running just perfectly until the customer forgot to put oil in with their gasoline mix and ate this cylinder and piston up. It actually seized in there and I had to tap it out. I don't know if you can see well in there. Hopefully you can. But you can see the gouge marks in there from where it ate itself up. Same thing with Mr. Piston. I have had that in a different video, and yes, it is the same little motor. But being the engine had only ran for pretty much about a week, maybe two, it is 100% salvageable. I didn't want to bore everybody with the video. I personally cracked the case apart, checked to make sure there weren't a bunch of piston debris and metal shavings in my lower unit there were not just a couple little fragments everything else looked good so we're going to go ahead and put this back together also we're going to change it over to the two part obviously cylinder and head which everybody is usually used to running or seeing but just so you know these little one-piece cylinders work just fine. The little motor had a lot of pep. Seemed to run just fine until that fateful moment with the lack of oil. Okay. Now, a little something for our performance friends on their cylinders, and it holds true to every cylinder. When you're building a race engine of any magnitude, generally... You take the cylinder, which will be your engine block, or your cylinder for like motorcycles and what have you, and your piston to the machine shop, and they will match bore it. They will mic and measure. They have the specs to know what clearance they need from their piston and their cylinder to allow for expansion during heat, enough clearance on the piston skirt for oil, to be adequately in there because it has to have oil to keep it lubed going up and down. Also, their circumference to make sure it is 100% round, wasn't bored off or anything, because if the rings don't expand to a complete circle, then they will leak air, which is you losing compression. Now, unfortunately, we have to face the facts that these little gas-powered bike engines are not Mercedes and Ferrari quality parts. So they are not machined as such. And every once in a while, you will buy a cylinder and it will have a bad bore. Now that is not something you can check with your old everyday mic, which everyone seems to have in the bike world. These work great to measure to see what size your cylinder is. But as you can see, you can only get so in-depth and measure the top. Same thing with the piston. You can measure your piston with it. That way you know what size piston to order. Gives you just the general schematics. Now to get down to the hundred thousandths of machine shop quality, they have bore dial gauges where this is a gate this would be a gauge and there'd be a gauge on top and you hit the button and the little sides pop out let me get my arm out of the way much like this and you measure that and you know what size your hole is but for the little engines don't have one that small so we go with our old school setup before they invented the bore dial gauge and we use this we can go down and take our measurements at the top and the middle and the very bottom 
So what we will do to see what the measurements are is put that little guy in there, come back to our mic. Now our mic gets down to hundreds of thousands. And also, to make sure that you tighten it up correctly, it has a little ratchet end. So you will screw it in, and when it stops, that way it measures accurately every single time. So, having said that, we will take our telescope measuring tool. You can hear the ratcheting. And then we will take our measurements and read them. You can see the fine little numbers there. So we'll take our measurement, write that one down. reinstall at a different angle make sure that it is straight as possible tighten up the end and then we will put that one in there and then we will take our measurements again and we will do that let me move that out of the way. At various angles, like I say. Let me get that. that way, that way, that way. Make sure you miss the ports. It won't work if you're in the port department. That way you can measure the metal of your cylinder. You'll take all your measurements and make sure that that is 100% true all the way down. If it's not, then your rings will leak. If it's not in the tolerances of break-in, then your rings will leak and you'll lose compression. And with a two-cycle engine, compression is everything. It is the entire lifeblood and power of your two-cycle engine. So if anyone has bought a new cylinder and a piston, went ahead and installed it, ran it for a little bit, because I've seen folks where they buy the window piston and the window cylinder so they can get a little more horsepower out of their engine. Sometimes they're disappointed or whatnot. They'll pull the head off, and there'll be wear marks in one little spot here, but no wear marks here, and same thing variously throughout the cylinder. That means you just happen to get a bad board cylinder. If you're lucky... During break-in, if it's just a smidgen off, and I won't kick out any numbers because I don't have any specs on what the wear is before the ring seat, and by the ring seating, I mean in the very beginning during your break-in period, none of the parts are matching. The rings haven't completely seated and sealed in the hole, etc., so that's why during your break-in period, you don't want to hot dog your bike too much and race it because you'd like these parts to casually meet, casually wear in. When the rings seat, they make a perfect circle. That gives you your 100% compression. If your cylinder is bored correctly and everything's going smoothly in that department, machine shop-wise, it should have even wear all the way up and down the cylinder. Unfortunately, if you do have the odd wearing cylinder, that just happens to, like I said, you just happen to get one that wasn't bored 100% the way it should be. It's not your fault. It's just the uh, quality of parts they're distributing to us. And not a lot you can do about that. Okay. So, let's put this little guy back together. Everything mic'd out that this little dude's round as it's ever going to be. So, we'll remove those tools and get to putting this little dude back together. Having said all that, let's get started putting our piston and cylinder together. First, we're going to do a little lubrication, a little prep work. Now, I personally like to pre-lube everything that I can. That way, it's not running metal on metal. It has a little lubrication to start with. 
because it won't get any lubrication until the engine actually starts because that is how two cycles work. The oil is in the gas and the oil that is in the fuel is what lubricates your moving parts. I will give that a little drop. And I'll even shoot a little in the hole because that's where the oil and gas mix in the hole when it's running to lubricate the bearings. Okay, so I got my lubrication done. Move it around a little bit to make sure that it works itself in the bearing cage. My new base gaskets installed. Now I took the liberty before firing up the video to install one of the wrist pin clips. Because they're a little pain in the butt. I don't care how many times you put them on there. They're always a pain. And always a chance of them to spring and fly off. Now if you'll notice on the piston ring right here. It has a bevel on the edge. Now these are what you line up with the pins in the piston ring groove. To make sure the rings don't spin as the engine runs. You can't put them on upside down because it won't allow you to compress the ring to put it in the cylinder. So there is only one way for these to be installed. So I will look for my second ring groove pin, which is right there. Now you don't want to torque and really pull on your piston ring. You just want to do it delicately. So I'm going to start it in that second groove right by my pin. And then just stretch it around enough to get in there. Just like that. And then when I'm done, you can see that my ring compresses. Slippery little guy. At my pin. And I will do the same with my top ring. Where's my pin? There's my pin. So I will gingerly and... And there it goes. Okay. So my rings are installed. Before I get going too much further, I will put a little oil in my cylinder so that my piston does not slide up and down on an unlubricated steel to steel surface. I want some lubrication in there for its initial startup. A little thin film on the piston. And now we are ready to install it. Now some people like to put the piston on the rod and the keeper and then slide down. And that is 100% all right. If that's how you want to do it. And then slide the piston in there and then get the rings in the bottom of it and slide it on down. I might do it a little different than some folks. I personally like to install it in here. That way I know it's installed correctly before I slide the whole assembly down. And then I only have to fool with one clip for the piston wrist pin keeper there to keep it intact. And then I slide it on down. Now this piston, if you'll notice, a little oil residue, has a three stamped on it, but it doesn't have an arrow to tell me which way to go. So we're going to revert back to our rule of thumb that the, the little pins that keep my rings from rotating while it runs always go to the back of the engine or toward the intake side. So I will turn my cylinder to my intake side, which is this side. And then I will install my piston that way. The edges are beveled to help you out, but you still have to compress and squeeze your ring in there. So we'll get the first one going. And a little squeeze and a little wiggle. And the same thing for number two. And in she goes. Just like that. Now I'll pull it up just a little bit. I want to keep the rings inside the cylinder but I need the availability to get to my wrist pin for when I slide this down. 
Okay. So let's get this big fella installed. Our bearing is in and lubed. Our gasket's on. And we are ready to install. Okay. I will slide that down. Look through the hole for where she's lined up with the wrist pin. They are snug fit. It is not sloppy. So if you don't first get it, don't worry. Sometimes you got to make a little adjustment here and there. Okay, I need to go up just a little bit. Okay. A little wiggle. Okay, now I'm going to use a screwdriver. You can use what you want, but you have to be really careful. I'm just using it because I don't have a fingernail to press it in. And I slide it in until I feel it hit that keeper on the other side. Okay, before I fight the keeper in there, I am going to put paper towels all around here to make sure if the keeper does fall out of my pliers or my needle nose or whatever you want to refer to them, that it doesn't go down inside the engine. I'd rather it fall on the cardboard or something like that before... It goes down in the engine. Let's see if I can't use this head to prop that up so you can maybe hopefully get a better view. Take my needle nose pliers. Push it in there. Pull my pliers out. And look at that. Now, I personally take my screwdriver and I make sure that it is in there properly. It is very important for that not to be out of its groove. That's what keeps the wrist pin from coming out and scratching your cylinder wall. So that part is massively important that you do that. Make sure it's in my groove. Let me get a smaller pair of needle nose here. I feel it is in the groove and it's ready to slide down. Okay, I've checked that one to make sure that one is in properly. And one last spin to make sure that one is in properly and snug. Now we're ready to remove our paper towels because our keeper didn't fall down in there. And that's a good thing. So now I will just squeeze that, push that down on our base, and we should be in good shape. Let's take a look and see. Ready to go. Okay, now we'll slide our gasket on. Be careful not to bend it. Sometimes it gets a little tricky on the threads there. That's down flush and sitting like it's supposed to. Slide our head on. And we should be good to go. Now a little tip that I'll share with you 
being as you're watching the video and I dropped one of my flat washers. When these motors come from the factory, and before I drop anything in that hole, let's take a paper towel and clog that up until we're done, shall we? All right, where was I? When they come from the factory, they use those chrome sealed top acorn nuts. I'm not a big fan of these because I believe that is what gives everybody a fit. I have one somewhere to show you. These, everybody a fit because sometimes they do not machine and or get the studs completely even. So when you're torquing down your head and you don't want to use a pile of washers, which I'm not a big fan of doing. To make up the difference, they use a big pile of washers and put these acorn nuts on there. And sometimes the acorn nut, the stud bottoms out in the nut and you're not actually squeezing the head and cylinder assembly together. It's actually just tightening it down on that studded right there and can allow your head gasket to blow. So my personal suggestion is lose the acorn nuts, get the open face nut. That way, no matter what size these are, you know when you tighten them down that it's actually squeezing the head down and smashing the gaskets. Or compressing the gaskets, you're not really smashing them, I guess. And then we will snug these up just to be safe. I always say it's not a bad idea to go with a crisscross pattern. So we'll snug that one down. And then move over to its counterpart. And then we'll move up to this little guy. And then we'll catch that one. Now that I got them just snug down, I'll do it one more time. Okay. We should be in good shape. Let's test it out. See if she's still rotating as it ought to. Okay. This bad fella should be ready to fire up. Now, one last tidbit about the head tightening part. It is a good idea to do it in an X pattern. It also is a good idea to torque, use a torque wrench. Now, I use a torque wrench, but not everybody at home has a torque wrench. And who wants to buy one just for one of these little dudes? So as long as you make these tight and not use a lot of force on them, but just make them snug and then give them a little extra... And stay in your X pattern. You'll know through your hand when you have to start really gurring down on it. That's probably a sign that you're pretty good shape. Tight enough. And then come over to that one. And then I will start this way one more time. Snug it down. The wrench stops. I'll leave that well enough alone. Because I will retorque them after its first initial running. The head nuts, the head nuts and the exhaust bolts after the first initial running and it gets up to operating temperature, everything expands and contracts. It's not vibration that makes them lose. Now after this engine runs for a heat cycle or two, which is normal operating temperature, 
I'll go back over and re-torque my head nuts one more time. And you'll notice after that that they will turn a little bit because the gaskets now have softened up a little bit. Everything has met each other. The exhaust gasket is usually, after your first initial running, it's real thick and it heats up and shrinks. So that is why your exhaust will be loose right after your initial, probably second ride or whatnot. You'll notice when you put your wrench to it that you'll get an eighth or a quarter of a turn out of them. It's not from vibration. It's from the gasket getting hot and shrinking. And after you retorque your uh, exhaust, usually you don't have to ever fool with it again. After the gasket shrank once, it doesn't keep shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. It does it once, maybe twice at the most, if you didn't do it, get it hot enough the first couple rides. And uh, usually after that, you have no problems. But at least now, if you are a person that has the two-in-one or all-in-one cylinder and you have a problem with it and you can't find a new all-in-one cylinder, like this little guy, and you can't find it, you can change it over, as you've seen, in the two-in-one. Or the old-school way of doing it, or however you want to refer to it. But this one's ready to roll. I'll shoot a little video of it whenever I put it on a bike. I just rebuilt that little dude to put on the shelf, just in case it should help somebody out. Their motor goes sour on them, and they're using it to go to work or school or wherever they're going. I hate for people to have to wait, so if I happen to have an extra one on the shelf, a remanufactured one, I will tell them so. They're welcome to buy it if they are in a pinch, and if not, I'll keep it on the shelf for when I'm in a pinch. All right, well, thanks for watching. I hope you learned a little bit on uh, how to check the roundness of your actual cylinder. If you don't have the necessary equipment to do that measuring with the telescoping and the mic, if you have a machine shop or small engine repair place close to where you reside, they will usually do it for you. If you take it to them, they'll take the measurements for you and let you know what you got. All right, until my next video, everybody ride safe. Take care of yourself out there, and I will see you later.